I'm scared of my fingers. Surprisingly enough, that held a lot more than I thought. What's going on everyone? Today's episode, we're gonna focus on this metal hot glue gun. And for all of us welders that can't get those welds to stick. Now those of us just getting started with the MIG welding process or gas metal arc welder. That is the technical term that we'll use when it comes to this wire fed process using shielding gas, hard wire, all those good things to consider. Some of us don't have a powerhouse like this Everlast Cyclone 263 PI. You might have a smaller unit in your in-home hobby stuff, but all the rules still come into play when it comes to making a weld that just doesn't seem to stick to the metal that we're working on. Today, I've got some 10 gauge carbon steel. It could be daunting to process your own material sometimes, but if you have good abrasives, it is a little bit easier. Like I used this cutoff wheel from Walter, went ahead and got that 10 gauge all lined out, score it out with the cutoff wheel, run those couple passes back and forth to get that line started and then that cutoff wheel just kind of falls right through and gets every piece cut. The only problem with that is now you're typically going to be left with a bit of a burr. I hadn't seen these before, these flex cut wheels from Walter. While I was getting some zip cut wheels, I figured, hey, those look kind of funny. They got that weird shape, weird bumps all over them. They said they're really good for carbon and stainless and mill scale removal. I hate mill scale, and let me tell you what, those things were pretty cool, man. They're just working it back and forth. Doesn't matter if you pushed or pulled it, the mill scale came off with just the weight of the grinder in my hand. We've got four pieces prepped and tacked together. We've got three of them that are prepped for T-joints. We're gonna show different variables as far as how not to let them stick, but we left one with the mill scale on it and we went ahead and put on some cold gal sprays. Cause anytime you try to weld over rust or paint or mill scale, it could get you some lack of fusion problems. I've got my respirator, I got my MIG gun, I've got my 035 wire coming through here. We're gonna start with our first variable, probably the obvious one, which is your volts and amps aren't correct for the material thickness you're working with. Now machine settings are absolutely duper crucial. We've got our machine set to the 7525 mix mode. There's some other features on this machine like the inductance that you should be aware of. It's kind of like an arc force for your stick where it'll soften or crisp in your arc. Uh, the manufacturer for these that for most fillet welds is somewhere on like past 50%. It'll give a, a crispy weld. Then we're gonna be looking at the pre post postfo, start wire feed, end wire feed. I keep those pretty low. If you have them too high, they'll start stabbing right away and we wanna get that puddle started, maybe some up or down slope. Not a lot of machines, again, won't have these features. So if you don't have anything like this, just really just focus on your volts and your amperage. This is a constant voltage process, okay? So you're gonna be setting your voltage instead of your amperage. However, your wire feed is also considered your amperage. So it could deal a lot with your penetration. Very first one we're gonna weld is gonna be on some lower settings. So this one, I'm gonna start turning it down closer to 17 volts. And we're gonna also run this down. Again, this is also gonna be considered your amperage. I'm gonna run that down closer to 170. Even though we've got really good prep, our polarity is right, if we're just running too cold, it's gonna be a big issue. If you have a, a machine that just has those number knobs on them and it's only hooked up to 110 and not 220, I just recommend turning it all the way up, baby. Turn it all the way up. Honestly, I've made some worse welds in my day. What we're gonna do now is we're gonna go over to the machine, turn our volts wire feed speed back up, switch our polarity over inside the machine, change our ground over, and bring over that other coupon. We'll look at all these when we're done with them. Golly, melted a tip right up. Uh, try that again. Well, it's a weld nonetheless. It was awful, but I knew that was gonna happen. Next one, we're gonna do the prep and paint. So we're gonna switch the polarity back, keep that voltage and amperage the same, and make a weld. Oh, oh I hate this stuff. <laughs> oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. Holy shit. Nikes. Well, that was an absolute miserable time. Well, oh, let's just put a good weld on finally. And I need a little bit more sauce after that one. All right. Oh, 
Oh yeah, that one's in there. All right, let's take a look at all these things. Get this hood and respirator off. Yeah. Well, let's take a gander at these welds here. This one's gonna be our voltage and our amperage too low. From the outside looking in, it doesn't look like that bad of a weld. Some telltale signs of it while I was welding, if we get a playback towards the front edge of the puddle, I could tell it was really tough to get all the way down into the root of that weld. Not only that, but we have some evidence here on the weld underneath on the bottom toe, a bit of cold lap. Cold lap is that bit of weld that tends to want to roll where the toe doesn't blend and fuse in properly into the weld. And this is going to be probably one of those things we're going to see some less fusion than if we did it with the proper settings. So moving into the polarity issue, this one is a guaranteed way of getting lack of fusion or cold lap. We got a lot more cold lap in this weld on the top and the bottom. Not only that, but I guarantee you that sucker is not into that route whatsoever. Maybe you were running some self-shielded flux core and you were running DC negative. Maybe you just the machine came that way already set in the negative terminal. Just double check. It could only be one of two ways. If it welds that bad, you should probably check your polarity. Moving into that prep and the paint, there again, there was mill scale on that part and we painted it with the galvanized coating and it made an absolute mess. Most of the weld compared to the other welds, you can see there's a lot of divots and spaces undersized welds because it was literally blowing that weld out once that zinc got it to its vaporization point and it was built up underneath that fillet weld, it just Obviously you could tell those sort of things can prevent you from fusing in. Not only that, but if you're mixing mill scale rust paint into the weld metal, I'm not the scientist guy, but putting crap in something that shouldn't have crap in it probably result in some crap. Moving out of that into the good weld, it's a decent looking bead. I think the weld size could have been more accurate all the way across. We got one little low spot, but there's no cold lap in this weld. Pretty sure we got fusion down to the root, but there's only one good way to tell on a T plate and that's with the old fillet weld brake test. Let's break them all and then review what the brakes look like. Let's start with the ones that I think are gonna break the easiest. We'll start with the polarity one. I think that one's probably gonna break pretty easy. All right, polarity brake. Yeah, knew that was gonna happen. Just absolutely knew that was gonna happen. It is not stuck. We're gonna get a much closer look at that. Now we're gonna be working on the Prep and paint. I think there's less weld reinforcement here. Potential some spots with lack of fusion because of that, that paint and lack of prep. So we'll see. I'm scared of my fingers. Yeah. Surprisingly enough, that held a lot more than I thought. Again, we were running at those proper settings and once that voltage and stuff gets through the zinc and it, it does end up fusing to it, at least that's what I can tell, I might try to still work on that, but I don't think I can break that much further. Let's do the two cold. Dang, that one, that one done did the thing too. The good one should pass. I sure hope it passes. Well, shoot, I thought I was gonna get him to break. I got one, I got one. I hope you guys aren't too upset with me. I, I think I'm a little pooped out. I don't, I don't know what else to do. I have straight worked on these things, as you saw. Yeah, I don't want to do this anymore. I thought for sure I was going to at least break them, you know, and give you some metal to look at as far as fusion or not. But shoot, is this the cold one fused, the painted one fused? And the good one definitely fused. I mean, can't break the suckers. I mean, you saw the polarity one though. This one right here is gonna be a surefire way of not getting a MIG weld to stick. I've literally, as an instructor at schools, peeled off MIG roots out of plates. Like they put a root in and they're, hey, look at my root. And I go look at the root and I'm like, what is going on? Got a whole line of lack of fusion, which you can see on this coupon. You can just see this, the base metal, clear as day. There's nothing that fused, not only to the bottom part, but to the perpendicular piece coming into it. Definitely be sure that you don't have your polarity switched the wrong way. I'd still recommend prepping. It doesn't mean you can't burn it through. As far as getting too cold, maybe that was just cold enough for a good old kick test because it sure as heck held. Uh, of course, running your machine the way it should be with proper prep and polarity is definitely a surefire way to get your MIG weld to stick. Thanks for watching everyone. We'll see you guys on the next weld. Today's episode is all for those people that are using this metal hot glue gun but can't get their welds to stick. Let's talk about it. 
That's not a hammer. Donde estas, Matteo? Dale, dale. Good golly. I need to figure out a way to hang on to that sucker. I don't want to hurt my fingers. It needs to be this side. 